So welcome to today's FemCon seminar. Today we have two speakers joining us, both are medical doctors and researchers, and currently undertaking the MSc in Global Health at Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm. Dr. Anja Wimers trained as a medical doctor at Maastricht University. She's passionate about universal health coverage and has become an advocate for access to medicine. She was a European coordinator at universities, allies, allied for essential medicine, and is currently serving on its executive committee. Her current research focuses on the effects of COVID-19 on tuberculosis households in collaboration with the Friends for International Tuberculosis Relief. Dr. Teresa Futschiller is a medical doctor from Germany with clinical experience in pediatrics and pediatric psychiatry. She has done both quantitative and qualitative research uh, through her work at the Medical Education Center of TUM in Germany. And her current research is working with the research group for global child health and sustainable development goals and the NGO Malaria Consortium on a project to evaluate usability of pneumonia diagnostic tools in community health settings. So welcome to you both. We're very pleased to have you. Now, FemQuant is a network with diverse research interests, but I think I'm right in saying that many of us are social scientists rather than uh, medical researchers. So just before you kick off your presentation, I thought it might be useful if you could each very briefly say a few words about your research and in particular the sort of data that you collect or analyze in your research. Over to you two. Um, yeah, sure. So um, my previous research experience was um, on the one hand in my medical doctoral degree, but it was not very strictly a medical topic actually because it was in medical education and I was part of a video study um, where we had multiple raters and we were coding videos applying a categorical scheme that was previously um, defined. Um, thereby, we created a quantitative data set that then was analyzed. And the data was mainly focused on um, process oriented learning in case based medical seminars. Um, that was also videography studies were coding videos with a categorical scheme is also the work that I've been doing there as a student research assistant now together with another doctoral candidate. And um, then now during my master thesis, um, I'm working with a quantitative data set from a uh, cross sectional observational study. Um, that was done in four different countries, namely on the pneumonia diagnostic tools. Yes, <laughs> and I also did a variety of different researches. So um, I worked as a research assistant in regards to endometriosis, but that was um, purely um, quantitative data. So that was on the diagnostic, on different diagnostics and their sensitivity and specificity. And then for my medical degree, I also wrote a thesis and it was actually um, a qualitative review on the experiences of um, people living with HIV um, and how they view self-management. Um, and now I'm back um, to quantitative research <laughs> um, and I'm working with um, longitudinal da um, survey data um, in Vietnam. Um, yeah, so that's a, I think a brief overview yeah. of what we do. <laughs> yes. Um, great. So then we can get into our um, presentation. Um, so first I wanted to mention that um, what we're presenting today is not only our view on this topic, but it came out of a class discussion that we had during our research methodology course, um, where of course our whole class contributed, um, of which a few of them are here today. Which we're very happy about that they could make time during this um, stressful thesis period at the moment. Um, so just to introduce our class and put it into a perspective for you where this whole project kind of came from and um, uh, who those views also represent. Um, we're 33 students and we come from all continents except for Australia. Um, about half of us have a medical or health science background. And uh, we also have some fellow students though coming from the other natural sciences, microbiology or immunology, 
And we do have people from the social sciences, business and development sciences. So I think this was very a special environment for us to talk about reflexivity as well, because we had such a big variety of viewpoints and people who had done different approaches to research before. And also here we wanted to especially thank um, our quantitative methods teacher, Dr. Karina King, who um, is working as an epidemiologist and she really encouraged us and gave um, the space for us to talk about um, reflexivity and quantitative research as well. So first I want to introduce how what we did learn about reflexivity in, um, in our qualitative methods course that preceded the quantitative methods course. So their reflexivity has been used by social scientists for more than three decades and it is one of the um, six premises of qualitative research that you can see on the slide here as well. Um, that are aimed to deal with or manage the subjectivity in qualitative research as well, especially um, reflexivity is there seen as a quality assurance and quality control measurement. And as we learned, it consists of two different dimensions where the first dimension is more about the research question and why this specific research question can be asked at the moment. Um, what are the different interests in this research question? So to ask yourself, how does your affiliations um, influence this? Or where is the funding coming from? And why is a certain project attracting funding? But then also the second dimension, which is here the outer part of this circle. So this deals more with the researcher themselves and who is the researcher? Um, what's, the what's the professional background? and also what's the cultural background and how do those characteristics of a researcher um, shelf, shape the research methodology or certain um, decisions that are made during the research process. Um, so this um, dimension then also deals with more the interviewer bias or respondent biases that might be introduced. So what is the complex interaction or, or relationship between a researcher and participants in the research study. Um, so this is what we had learned in our qualitative methods course. And then um, we changed to a quantitative perspective um, mm -hmm. that rose to certain questions for us about the position of reflexivity in quantitative um, methods. Yeah, so uh, we started wondering ourselves, is there maybe a need for reflexivity in quantitative research as well? Uh, which is a, it's a complex question. Um, and maybe to share an anecdote of um, how we, we felt um, like a concrete example that where we really experienced a possible need for reflexivity was that um, we had an exercise where we all got into little groups and we were given the same data set um, with the task of coming up with log logistical regression. And the interesting thing was that while we all had the same data set, in the end, every single group had a slightly differing um, regression model. Um, and that's because um, in every group, there would be people with different backgrounds and based on their backgrounds, they would choose different confounders and different effect modulators based on what they knew, but also based on the best practices that they were used to in their own fields. Um, so when we then asked this question in the discussion afterwards, um, whether there was a need for reflexivity uh, in quantitative research too, um, this quote came up, uh, which, which we thought was very nice, which was why we wanted to highlight it. And that's while carrying out quantitative research, you notice that there is some sort of gray zone. You have to make choices. And I think that's exactly the point. Um, so numbers may be objective, but the, the process of obtaining them, um, yeah, they come, a lot of choices come with it. So um, it, that is not always uh, objective. Um, but of course, there are certain mechanisms already in place. Um, that, that do consider those choices that have to be made in quantitative research. There's methodological checklists so that the reader can later check if every, if every decision that was made um, was, um, was kind of explained in the research. And um, there's also a section for limitations and discussions where um, possible biases are addressed. Um, and, people, and the authors also are asked to in, include possible conflicts of interest. Um, but we asked ourselves as a class, like, is this enough? Um, and the consensus was kind of that um, it's good that those mechanisms are in place, but we did feel that they needed to be elaborated on. Um, so just to give an example, when we look at conflict of interest, 
Um, often this just includes um, the institutions that we are affiliated with um, or funding, but it doesn't include everyone's background and where they come from, how old they are, what they've been exposed to. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that don't go into this process. So we felt that there was a need to elaborate on this. Um, so our answer as a global health class was a clear yes, we need more reflexivity. Um, because it's a very important opportunity for us ourselves to also reflect on it. As Teresa pointed out, we come from um, all over the world. So we all bring different, uh, different backpacks and a different view on the world. Um, and that um, then you also think we are being educated at Karolinska Institute and that's um, placed in a high income country. But then we, we go into the world, hopefully, uh, as future global health professionals and we'll work in very uh, different health settings all around the world. So I think uh, we all thought that it was very important to take this opportunity to reflect um, on our own pre-assumptions while we're carrying out research. And in doing so, um, this also decreases inequities and also actually increases the quality of the research because um, by doing so, you explain the context um, around the, so it's not just the research by itself, but the context is also explained. Um, so we believe that actually um, reflexivity can increase the quality rather than um, decrease it. Um, and lastly, we felt that it was very important to be incorporated into the curriculum um, because it is such an important point for reflection. And because, as I said before, it decreases inequities and is an opportunity to actually increase quality. So I think we really uh, enjoyed uh, getting to know the concept um, and thinking about this further. So um, during this in-class discussion we had, or before even, um, we also kind of looked into literature and the whole discussion that we had is also based on a few things that we had read about um, and that we brought up in the class discussion, which we wanted to present here as well. So this first one um, was a, pa a paper by two Irish researchers that were doing a research with Irish immigrants in London. And it was first a quantitative project um, that was done as a survey, but then um, the authors describe in this article how they then realized that um, there was more additional data within this uh, within this project. And while doing the surveys, people kept telling them more stories and um, they kind of collected something that went beyond the scope of what um, the survey questionnaire that they had could actually hold. So um, they were reflecting on what why, where does this come from and how to deal with it? And they describe in this article that here also, because they were both Irish and it was very, um, people could really tell from their accents as well that they were Irish and that that might have influenced for people to share their stories more and that they were also themselves more affected by this research. Um, so this was a very interesting article that kind of highlighted that there is an addition, that there are things like this might come up, there's an additional dimension in your data that you didn't um, count on before or that you didn't think about before. Um, so that's where reflexivity can also help to deal with those situations and be more open to um, those kinds of things happening. And they then went on to add a qualitative component to their, um, to their research project. Um, something else that we read about and that is also very much connected to what Anya said about our exercise in class, where we uh, all ended up with slightly different um, regression models, um, is this paper where they had multiple replicators analyze two same data sets. And then in the end, like none of them had the same sample size. And um, also the statistical significance was varying between their models. Um, so this really highlighted the those decisions that you make. And as we said before, a lot of times those decisions that you make are along the way are not as objective as you might think in the first place. So um, this was really interesting to also see. And then lastly, this paper here is also, that was very important in our discussion. And I think um, it influenced also the way that we thought about reflexivity a lot. Um, here the authors uh, gave a statement that they demanded for ref uh, reflexivity statements in a publication process, and they highlighted the special relevance of this in the field of global health because 
they said it could be a tool to help um, decolonization in global health and uh, promote more equitable authorships because adding reflexivity statements and also publishing them would make um, the research process more transparent and also the power relationships that go with the research um, more transparent. Um, and if this process is formalized, we, uh, we thought this is a very good opportunity because also a lot of times it's not one single author themselves that can influence um, the situation that much, but still you can reflect on it. And especially the audience or the people who read your article in the end um, can use those reflexivity statements to put the research just in a bigger picture or in a bigger perspective. Yeah, so then uh, after we had agreed that we felt that reflexivity was important and after we, we'd gone and done some readings on it, um, we were thinking, okay, so we, we want to incorporate more reflexivity into uh, quantitative research, but then the question is how? Um, so we had a little brainstorm and we came up uh, with a framework, um, which I'm going to present to you in a second, but I already want to say that um, we're lo really looking forward to um, everyone's thoughts on this as well, because I think, yeah, this is like a very new new thing that's happening now. So I think it would be nice to get everyone's input. Um, but basically the idea is that um, we structured it as a free, uh, free phase process. Um, so one part taking place before the research even starts and then one part during the research and then some um, future reflection afterwards as well. Um, so the first point um, is the motivation. So before you even start carrying out a research, I think it's important to go into yourself and think about why am I personally interested in this research question? Um, but also um, why, why is there a need for these re this research question? And then also to look into the funding in terms of um, why is there interest to fund this project? Um, what are they getting out of it? And to also think of, okay, what is the benefit? Because every research is supposed to have a certain benefit for someone. Um, so what is this benefit and who will be benefiting from it? And that also ties in uh, with ethics. I think it's very important to at this point, we talked about inequalities um, and decolonizing uh, global health, I think. Um, so it's also important to consider these things in that process. Um, so are there inequities um, that should be considered? Um, and then uh, looking further, when, when a research is being built, um, is there a use of theory? And then what is this theory based on? What are my own pre-assumptions going into the process? Um, have I used different theories or is, like, is there a set of theories that have been applied? Um, and what exactly are the research priorities? Um, and then of course, we mentioned conflict of interest a couple of times. Um, so also here to think about the conflict of interest. Um, to think who are the stakeholders who are involved in the process, how do they interact? Um, yes. Um, so then while the research, so that's the part that takes place before the research. And then as you move into the research, it's important to think about um, the methods which were chosen and why were certain uh, methodologies chosen over others. Um, and uh, if you have a protocol, how did these decisions change throughout the research? Because I think everyone in the research community kind of knows that often changes are made um, during as well. Um, and we wanted to particularly highlight um, the need for reflexivity in the data collection, um, because we felt that it, that it could be improved because of what Therese mentioned, um, the paper on the Irish uh, researchers, where we saw that um, that people react differently and they answer questions differently based on who asked them questions and the settings they're in. Um, and I think in qualitative research, that's very, very highlighted of how does, how, what is this interaction? Um, but in quantitative research, there, there could be some elaboration on that. Um, and then lastly, um, we felt that it was also important to afterwards think about um, the, how was the data analyzed? Um, how, um, how did the researcher themselves influence this analysis? Um, and does um, the analysis also make sense looking at other sources? Um, and then I think the last takeaway, which is really something um, for the researcher themselves, a good learning opportunity is to really think about um, what am I taking away from this? Um, what have I personally learned? And um, what can we learn from this research in general? Yes, and then um, Teresa's gonna share some of the, the key the key learnings <laughs> that we want to 
yeah 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 <laughs> nice um so yeah just as like a small summary of what came out of this um discussion that we had and um the process and while we were writing the article i think you can pretty much or a lot of things fit within those three parts that we found as uh, our within our field of global health what is the special chance of reflexivity so um, I think we're all very grateful that this topic of reflexivity has been brought up in our course, also from a quantitative perspective, um, even though it is not part of the formal curriculum. And um, it was very um, useful for us to have that chance to ask ourselves those questions and um, to also think about these things very critically. And I think that critical thinking is a very important part of teaching and um, kind of putting this question up of, um, do you need reflexivity in quantitative research and why would you need it is a very engaging way to uh, make students critically think about research methodologies. And I think this is also will be very helpful for us in a future prospective research career to kind of have this ability to always question um, the classical things that have been done like this for such a long time. And then um, secondly, I think that also in our field, it's a lot of um, quantitative and qualitative methodologies. It's a lot of mixed methods research as well. Um, and we very much felt like that it doesn't need to be seen as contradictory and that the dichotomization of the two method methodologies can be a bit problematic, um, but we would rather prefer to see them as complementing each other. And um, then lastly, we were also talking in our discussion about that because reflexivity is a quality measure to deal with subjectivity in um, qualitative research and because subjectivity is kind of a taboo in quantitative um, methodology, that this might be a reason why reflexivity might be perceived as a threat to objectivity in quantitative research. But um, I hope that um, we kind of help to <laughs> put it in our perspective as well, that we think it is rather a chance to increase quality um, than to threaten objectivity because um, if you acknowledge that there are certain things that can never be completely objective and that there's always an influence um, on your analysis plan, on your study designs, and then reflexivity can really be a chance to um, help and increase quality of the research as well. Yes, and uh, then we want to thank you for your attention and th thank you for uh, the feminist approach to quantitative and social science to be hosting uh, the seminar. I think we're really looking forward to everyone's input. Uh, we also really briefly want to thank uh, our amazing um, global health course. It, like, um, I think we're very, very lucky that we have these insp inspiring um, brainstorms and discussions and that we are continuously learning from each other. Uh, and once again, also special thank you um, to our course leaders in research methodology, Karina King and Helen Mustard Alderson. And now um, we want to open the floor. Um, we have uh, some questions um, where we would like that we would like to discuss. Um, so we would like to hear um, what people think. Uh, is there a need for reflexivity in uh, quantitative research? What are maybe the different challenges and benefits in different fields? Because we come uh, from a medical, um, yeah, from a medical field, and now from a global health field. But uh, I'm sure we have. And people from different fields in the conversation today so that's uh, very exciting um, and lastly we would also we really welcome comments on uh, how can it be incorporated so if if we agree that there is a need for reflexivity how do we do that and um, you've seen our ideas on a possible framework so uh, we're very intrigued what other people have to say yeah thank you thank you